The next episode contains some pretty foul language, uh, drug references, reference to good sex, uh, rough life, and psychedelic uh, description. So enjoy it. There seems to be a new fad among the hookers of Amsterdam. Glasses. Strolling through the night crowd of slightly horny, slightly embarrassed, and fully frustrated bands of single guys acting cocky with their mates. Copies. Cop. God damn it. Let's try it out again. There seems to be a new fad amongst the hookers of Amsterdam. Glasses. Strolling through the night crowd of slightly horny, slightly embarrassed, and fully frustrated bands of single guys acting cocky with their mates. Couples where the girlfriends look ready to bite off their hubby's balls at the slightest sign of getting off on all their cheap roasty flesh on display. Other couples where the wife seems to hope that the sight of all but bare boobs and willing arses will finally suffice to harden the husband's long dormant drizzler long enough for her aching lonely cunt with the stretched out labia rolled into her panties, much like she rolls up her saggy tits in the morning to fill up her padded brassiere, to get filled, fucked and fatigued after a frenzy of frantic bed wrecking fighting off old age. Fuck him to death. Leave false teeth marks on his neck for the coroner to ponder over when they lay him on the slab. Fuck him to death and get some dumb stuff, some dumb fuck dipstick on legs to spend the heritage with. Make him drink her piss mingle with champagne as she... Glasses. They look ever so fucking hard on some of the girls. Women, actually, that spend a good deal of attitude on not looking their age, but someone of an eternal, fictive 16-year-old not knowing what to do with the moist beast between her thighs, its gaping mouth salivating with lust for dick redemption. Glasses. Can't help but notice, though, that they all seem to be wearing the same model. Like some dumb wit pimp got off on a school teach porn flick, I went on the internet to order 50 pairs of the same black, slightly ovalish rimmed glasses with the outer corner mildly pulled up. Mildly. Nowhere near the Dame Edna version, because that would kill off the thrill, of course. There is probably a niche market for that as well. Maybe some old guys or Catholic nerd out there getting stiff over 50s glasses on 70-year-old aunties with a passion for spanking dirty boys on the ballsies. But hey, as I say, a niche market. And the red light district is all about catering lust to the masses. As they pile through the streets, drunk or getting there, stoned or on the way, tripping on mushrooms, magic truffles and the likes, tripping over their astonishment over the candid display of proof that everyone's a dirty mind on a hot crutch. Couples lining up to see the life fucking on stage shows. Both partners seemingly ready to say, look hon, that's how it's done. Let's go, pick up a bag of aphrodisiac. Let's get back to the hotel and practice this modern-day Kama Sutra display. And I, I'm wandering through the crowd and wondering how much gold and silver and lost jewelry will be lining the pavement by midnight and beyond into the stretch of dawn, as the wasted punters ever more carelessly pull and push stuff in, out, in, out, in, out to their pockets, as they go for the next dose of dope, the next bottle to pay, the next session of the old... In, out, in, out, in, uh... There's sure to be a fortune there, but I can't see any, because I lost my glasses a long time ago. Cities are whores. They're rising and crumbling buildings like ever-shedded skin cells. It's flags like halter tubs and flimsy tongues. It's workers in bars and restaurants like nipples oozing out the manna of hometown milk. It's homeless like lonely pubic hairs forever cast out to the fringe of the honey pit, the dispensary of fine nectar, the crutch of all crutches. It's bank and real estate developers like the chunky and firm buttocks, the attractive hiding cove to the brown hole of ass, the sewer of the unholy death of all life, Consumed in its brick-lined stomach, its concrete guts, broken up by the gall and bile of administrations, regulations, and premeditated annihilations. 
Its streets and subway lines, like arteries, sinews, and nerves, shut through with blood cells, parasites, neurons, and reflexes, diseases, sugars, oxygen, nitrogen, and all sorts of genes, all thinking they're people, leading separate yet somehow intrinsically interlinked lives. It's neon and billboards and public information signs, like the boudoir decor, leading your furtive gaze to the thinly veiled hole of holes, the hardly hidden hope of hard-ons, the moist and shiny cavern of the fountain of youth, saying, come in, come here. Disrobe, dismantle yourself, your honesty, your life. Give me your fortune while you seek to take mine. Give me your pleasure while you long to share mine. Give me your cum, your livelihood, your essence as you, seek, as you seek shelter within me. And behold, at the entrance of bliss, the cruel hand of law and order, tradition and normality of reap and reward and punish foremost the lazy, the wondrous and bewildered, the believers in luck and unbelievers of mediatized pre-chewed reality, that cruel hand forever rubbing the city's clit to keep it lusty and looking young, spreading a craze and perfume pervading its hole with a sense of home, of hope, of an orgastic everlasting tomorrow, and as a stupid, trembling, stiff dickhead, ready to launch yourself upstream, ready to come, come and die like a motherfucking salmon. That ever masturbating hand of common decency grabs you by the balls, plucks you off the ground and leads you to reception, the head office, the glaring inspections of CCTV, fingerprints and passports, and throws you wailingly headfirst into the vagina dentata, the gaping ever hungry mouth of the city, its molars grinding your bones to factory worker size, your mind to desk clerk bits, your dick to liverwurst, your arse a bosses and landlords fuckhole, your tears to lube for the next Next contract signed in blood, written in shit, as the screaming, laughing, self-fulfilling whore of whores, city of cities, narcissistically rides Shiva's marble dick into oblivion. All praise the gods for human intelligence, without which this whole charade would not exist, and we would find ourselves merely happily, haphazardly surviving on the face of a living, ever-evolving, ever-evolving divine planet our questing nature in tune with the ups and downs of the waves, moon and sun, our hairs and minds waving with the wind, our breaths and aspirations like a singing breeze, not unlike that of chittering birds and growling beasts, lustful and loving, and discovering in defiance of death and its myriad diseases. There seem to be two leggeds there, there in the mists that line these everlasting waters, there in the mists of time and space, there in the mists on the fringes of his mind, setting a new border on reality, a threshold to a future, a birth into a different circumstance, a dying off of the continuum of lonely floating on a river of thought and longing, shit, fish and cum, of urinating and drinking from that same flow of water, of self-repetition, they were standing there, rootless yet unmoving, thoughtless as, as this had never happened before, and speech and the conditioning of mind through language was as yet in some distant future to be developed by them or a, a species akin. Raw feelings that later on would find themselves encompassed by names like fear, panic, disorder, joy, hunger, happiness, comfort, longing, lust, Anger, aggression, anticipation, bewilderment, anxiety, mindfulness, half a hard-on and the need to pee, defecate and throw up, an itch in places that can be scratched, in public or otherwise, now as it was then. There were more than nose, seers and ears, more than grabbers and runners, more than the twigs at the end of these, but much less than standers together and certainly less than nesting on a standing or water that he passed to get there. Maybe somewhat as many as birds in a flock. Not like the tiny ones that flew in numbers to mimic and become one great ominous beast of communal hunger, anger, passion, comment and commitment, pinions as opinions, living on a common tide of the ever-shifting winds. 
nor like big build lonely ones either, who seldomly came together except for making more loners happen, or fighting each other over the light over the right to be left alone. They were together, that yes, as ripples of motion and emotion went through them, reflected in the rippling waters around his approaching float, now apprehensively pulling along, slanting in, out, in, out of their direction, hopscotching the little waves in the current, like the extremes of emotion that already bound them, him and they, in an alliance as yet unknown. I remember one stop in a fight before it even happened. On a sunny day in the middle of a busy shopping street, as I recall, a chesty, bald-headed, clean-shaven guy with black leather jacket and just the right denim to go with it, taking his flawless white scarf that just had to go with it from around his neck. It was about halfway over his head in the movement of a boxer taking off his muscle-warming cape before getting his gloves checked. When I darted past and in between him and a pair of dark stone youngers from a downer town neighborhood dressed in darker tone casuals, that chitteringly I bumped and now due to the social hate requirement were standoffishly compelled to fight. Yet all three bound by such insecurity and willingness to get out respected and respectfully that it took a mere don't fight guys, the sun is shining to dispel the bond that tied them. As I came through, speeding up, with two heavy-ass djembes on my shoulder. Can't remember where they went after that, the djembes nor the people nor I for that matter, and, and matter it does always or at least in more than one way. So the standoffishness recited, reshaped and rekindled itself in a mutual unspoken agreement to least not to kill each other at first chance, and that it will most likely not kill themselves to approach each other in the same manner. And so breaths were taken without too much poise, movements slow and visible, eyes questing and questioning, rolling and darting, seeking to comprehend the beholden without, since, before, words, yet not soundless, neither seamlessly. And indeed the absence of a discomforting cold drizzle from above or the discording early dark times when all howled, cried, shrieked, yacked, boohooed and ah in a game of stealth and super sensitivity that led everything still alive after dawn feeling fortunate for being so. Like the many colors of the edible shapes in the nesting and standards giving the scene an air of peace et abandon. The circumstance in which you land does a lot for the way you acquaint with a group and then with you. And he was lucky, because they didn't eat each other, or other two legs. No entrails fired dried and wrapped around grabbers or necks. No pile of empty out skulls to line the rocks. No big bits of standard sticky with old red, long gone brown and black. Near any of that herd, that flock, that family, that heap, that bushel, that spread, that chant of two-legged. And he smelled no red either, though some of the day were clearly two old ones. And yet not all, so that was a deflating relief, and he defecated slightly and rubbed his hole on a wad of nesting so the brown wouldn't stick, which apparently was something new. A cause of bewilderment to the day, furtively looking at each one another, and some scratching their arses and turning this way and that, and the floating stander bumped gently into the embankment.